Hi, this is Nicole Rivera, and you're listening to the Stop Writing Alone podcast. Last week, I talked about the Natalie Goldberg writing practice and the course that I've been in with uh, Natalie Goldberg that's all about that. And um, I also was discussing how uh, this previous weekend I was signed up for a 24-hour short story contest. Got the prompt at noon. I'm sorry, it was noon central time. So for me, it was 1 p.m. And had to have a 900-word story completed by the end of 24 hours, by Sunday at 1 p.m. submitted. And what I wanted to talk to you about this week is how the practice, the writing practice that I've been doing with Natalie Goldberg actually served me in this moment where I had to work on a deadline to write a story uh, that was fiction. You know, nothing to do with, I mean, the writing practice is typically the topics that um, that Natalie's been giving us are usually things that lend themselves toward nonfiction, observing the world around us or remembering things um, in our own lives. So, uh, you know, there's this question of, what am I practicing for? I don't I don't get it. How come when I'm doing my writing, that's just not practice? How can this help? So um, I'm going to begin first by just telling you, if you didn't see uh, it on YouTube, I shared the prompt that we were given for this 24-hour contest on YouTube, just in case anybody wanted another writing prompt, and also just to um, let you know how this this contest tends to go. So I want to just read to you the the um, the topic that we were given. Hold on one sec. So the it's a prompt that's kind of a scenario, and uh, here it goes. It says, "All the townsfolk said she'd not survive out here alone. Yet here she was working the soil for the second spring. After a frigid winter, she could finally dig her fingers into the warming earth." She patiently sifted clumps, making way for the tiny roots her carrots would put down as they sought ancient nutrients left there by their rotted brethren. One clump did not feel like dirt at all. Puzzled, she grabbed hold of it, pulled, and dot, dot, dot. That's the prompt. Um, But the, the woman who runs the contest went on to explain that You didn't have to quote that. You didn't have to be specific to it. Uh, You didn't even have to have a female protagonist. You could change the character. In essence, go nuts, but just make sure that your story can be identified as something that was inspired by this topic. Okay. It, it was strange for me because usually when I'm given a prompt, it's like, this is the prompt. These are the rules. Stick to it. And then the, the rest of the email went on to be very specific about um, the different things that the judges were not interested in seeing. And it's we've there's a group of us that were talking through the weekend as we were all participating in the contest. And it goes back and forth over like whether or not this was frustrating, helpful or um you know, like what, why did we need so many details? And one thing that I found really interesting about it is that it was, it was as if the judge, we know that all judges and contests are subjective at the end of the day. And this is not just judges and contests, but also people who are reading our submission letters or our query letters. Everybody is subjective when it comes down to their taste and deciding whether or not they're going to accept or, um, you know, award a piece of writing. Um, What was very interesting about this email is that it seemed that, I guess, after all the years that they've been doing this contest, they've identified their points of subject subjectivity and kind of lined them up (laughs) and said, please don't give me a story with magic or monsters in it. I don't want to see that, Uh, you know, and, and just it kept going on. But there were also tips in there that were you know, broader scope and great tips for most any type of entries, you know, try to be original. Don't try to, um, 
uh, make the twist that they were all in a dream the whole time or what have you, you know, so it was a little bit of both and it was very interesting. Um, but just to say that I could go anywhere with this prompt and I really wasn't sure where to begin at first, but that afternoon I had been in, um, office hours for my Natalie Goldberg class. And the office hours is, is basically a combination of meditation, writing, and reading aloud what you wrote. And just like the regular practice, we are given a topic to write on. And so on Saturday, just at the same moment that I got the prompt, um, the first topic that we were given was tell us what season is in your blood. And I began to write. And I don't, I'm going to, I'm just going to read to you what I wrote because I'm not, um, there's nothing like, too, I don't think too personal in here that I haven't already <laughs> said on the podcast. Um, and just to give you a sense of what the heck happens in the writing practice, because what, as I said last week, when you do the writing practice, um, at least in the structure of these office hours, they give us the topic and they set a timer for 10 minutes and you just write. It's like a stream of consciousness writing. So this is what I wrote for, for this first topic. Tell us what season is in your blood. Um, okay. I was born in fall. Then I became a teacher. I look forward to the burst of color all around me in the New York trees as it falls to the streets. Autumn is in my blood. The crisp breeze that allows me to walk for hours without breaking a sweat. The return to routine with the school bells and yellow buses on the road. Even now, over a decade out of the classroom, the school calendar still fuels my spirit, celebrating New Year's in September, then hibernating in the summer. My father died on Thanksgiving, but that holiday still sings family to me, maybe even more so in some ways. That Thanksgiving was a different kind of birthday for me. I often wonder who that other Nicole would have been or become had her world not ended and demanded she become someone new at the age of 12. Autumn is a season of death and new beginnings. The leaves die and fall to the ground, but they offer a brand new clean slate upon the empty branches. That is how I feel in autumn. Each birthday, asking myself what parts of me will I let fall to the ground in this new year of growth. Then I spend the winter with my family, nourishing my own bare branches with the holiday traditions, feeding my roots, reminding me what grounds me before bursting back to productivity in the spring and resting in the summer. I grow slowly, that is for sure. And then the time was up. So I wrote this thing. And then we had a second writing practice topic. You need to know this. And then you're supposed to write for 10 minutes. You need to know this. Okay. That one was a little bit harder for me. But I still wrote it. I wrote for 10 minutes. And then I came out and I was like, wait, what the heck was that prompt again? And I pulled it back out, read the prompt, and spent the rest of the night trying to figure out what I was going to write about. And, um, and keeping in mind that one of the things on the list of we love to find this in stories is like a twist of some sort. They love, uh, not a twist, I'm sorry. They, they love really good endings, right? So that was in our conversation. They want a twist. What should we do? But because of this practice that I had done in the afternoon, I found myself remembering this piece about the uh, writing about fall, writing about the the season that's in my blood. The prompt was specifically about the season of spring, which is not my season, right? I mean, I love the spring. Spring, don't be offended. I love you. I've been enjoying walking outside, hearing the birds, seeing everything grow back. It's gorgeous. But fall is my season. And so I felt like this push and pull that this thing wanted me to write about spring, but I love fall. I just said it this morning. Um, and so I ended up writing a story about a teacher in the spring and digging in the dirt and not really liking the spring, 
for a mysterious reason. And it was one line in my practice that got me to the sort of punchline of my story. And I guess at this point, I should just read you the freaking story. I don't know what else to do. Hold on a sec. Let me pull out the story. Okay. And I'm thinking that I should read it to you just because I don't know how else to make this point without you knowing the story. So I called the story Educators on Earth. And here it goes. I continue to be in awe over how little most adults know about the livelihoods of teachers. It's one thing for a classroom of minors to imagine their teacher has no need of a restroom or that her bedroom's in the teacher's lounge. But the frequency with which I can slip through velvet ropes at the mere mention of educational intentions is staggering. I've given up on feeling guilty about it or putting much effort into my explanations. I have needs. This is how I fulfill them. The greatest of my needs is to halt the arrival of spring and all that comes with it. It's a nightmare of a season for teachers, and no one's talking about it. This year, I used this lackluster teacher superpower to gain access to the zoo on Groundhog Day. It's an event reserved for politicians and local press, only pumped into schools through live streams and supplemental PDFs. I propose that, with a first-hand account, I'd create a master lesson plan to share district-wide that could not only reignite in-school excitement over Groundhog Day, but would also increase school trips to the zoo by at least 20%. The truth was, I wanted to witness the overgrown rodent's prediction to see if there was something that could help me break the cycle. I've been teaching for 13 years. They say most teachers don't make it past three. I often wonder how those heroes dug themselves out. In year one, I'll be honest, I didn't know I was trapped. It was the second spring when the idealism was waning and the year was coming to a close that I first became aware. Marjorie Hamm was in the teacher's lounge, staring into the courtyard. It was her last year after 30 years of teaching, so I suspected that accounted for her watery eyes, but she said, what'll happen when I till the soil this spring? Will a gardening guru be born in retirement, Barge? I asked. She turned toward me wide-eyed. I stepped back, but she crossed the room, grabbing each of my arms just above the elbow with her gnarled, chalk-covered fingers. Don't you till your soil in the spring, Janet? Isn't that the first thing you do when school's out? I pulled myself free, rubbing my arms. Marjorie, what are you talking about? She leaned back on the long table in the middle of the room where we wrote lesson plans, graded papers, ate breakfast and lunch, cried on bad days, and laughed on good days. That wasn't the first time the table served as support for someone lost under the weight of a moment too much for one's soul to carry, and it wasn't the last. Marjorie didn't meet my eyes when she whispered, Someone told me to till the soil. I don't know who. I don't even remember the conversation, but I went to my garden, got on my knees, and worked the soil with my bare hands. I stared at her hands and imagined the chalk dust as black, loamy soil. I saw clumps clinging to her palms, and then I looked at my hands. I was lost somewhere between a daydream, a memory, and a craving, picturing that same soil on them. Marge, I said. I think I did till the soil, and I think I will till the soil today, after school. Marjorie and I locked eyes. She blinked tears down her wrinkled cheeks. I'm so sorry, Janet. I'm sorry there was no way to tell you before. It seems we can't talk about it. She shook her head, gave me an awkward hug, and left the room, the school, and my life forever. That afternoon, I went home, mindlessly packed my school supplies into my hall closet where they'd stay until fall, and walked out to the yard. I kneeled in the just warming soil of my garden. Part of me resisted the act, but it was no part of me that had any power to stop it. I dug my hands in deep, feeling the lingering chill buried beneath the surface as the sun beat on my back. I let the cool clumps of soil drizzle from my outstretched fingers as I pulled them out in front of me. Then I plunged my hands even deeper, wrapping my right hand around the familiar loamy texture of soil and my left hand wrapping around something else. I tore my right hand free and plunged it down next to my left hand to get two hands around this foreign solid substance that had no business being in my garden. 
As I pulled it back, I wasn't leaning backward to free it from the ground. Instead, I leaned forward, closer to the ground. I smelled the soil, the rot, and the dampness lingering from the last rain as my nose touched the ground before slowly getting pulled in and through the garden. My head, shoulders, back, buttocks, legs, and feet followed as I was reverse birthed into the soil for my season of sleep. You see, what no one told me, what Marjorie couldn't talk about, what I've been unable to escape for 13 years is the fact that some of those weird misunderstandings about teachers and their livelihoods are true. Completely beyond our own control, when the spring semester ends and before summer vacation can begin, teachers are thrust into hibernation. So that was my um, story that I submitted. Who knows if uh, if it will be... Uh, up to par or what have you. But the whole point of this episode is to note that that idea of a teacher going into hibernation in summer was from a line from my writing practice from that morning. I don't think I've ever thought about myself going into hibernation in summer until I was asked to write for 10 minutes on what season was in my blood. And I just had it here. I said, so even now, over a decade out of the classroom, the school calendar still fuels my spirit, celebrating New Year's in September, then hibernating in the summer. That's just what I wrote because I was just trying to keep my hand moving in the notebook, keep going with this idea of what season is in my blood and why, and answer those questions with details and specifics. And that's what I came up with. And so the really interesting thing for me is that earlier in the week when I was discussing the writing practice in a happy campers meeting, one of the writers was saying, but what, I, I don't understand what's the point. And I was just trying to convey what I believed would come of it. That And, and my belief was, and continues to be, that as we show up for this writing practice, I believe I said this last week in, in the podcast, as we show up for this writing practice, doing this type of 10-minute uh, meditative writing where we're fo- trying to be specific, focus on details, um, and just, you know, write on topics that maybe we weren't, wouldn't ordinary, ordinarily think about when we show up to the page, all of those are like little seeds getting planted in our brain or just fodder for the compost that we just keep inside our head. And, you know, maybe it just gets us better at observing or better at uh, writing details. But here was an instance that when I had started the story, I had started the story with this idea of Groundhog Day connecting to spring, and I I didn't know what the heck the teacher was going to find when she got to the dirt, but I was like, this teacher is going to be, you know, I had this whole thing going on with the groundhog in my head. And then at some point I was like, wait a second, hibernating in the summer, she's going to get pulled in. She's going to get pulled in to hibernate. That's what it's going to be. And again, like I said, I would not have thought of that um, I just never associated the hibernation with summer before until that, that writing practice. So it was like a little seed was planted in my head, whatever I was going to do with it at some point in my life, who the heck knows it ended up getting, you know, put into, into action, uh, later that day, which is amazing. So I just wanted to bring this as a sort of an example to you of the little influences that can happen, especially poignant for me that I was on this 24 hour deadline of writing a story um, that I could have wrestled with the, what the heck is gonna happen to this teacher for 24 hours plus, right? I could have just been sitting there saying, I don't know, I can't find something that really, that sings to me but there I was already having processed an idea that 
that made some sort of sense to me and felt um, felt like story. So, um, so that was it. That's really what I wanted to share with you, that this practice may seem just like... I, honestly, I mean, people have said, I don't know, it feels like it might be a waste of time for me. And we've talked about morning pages before and how they serve our mental health and, you know, they can really help in other aspects. So maybe they're not a waste of time because even if they're not helping me with my writing, they're at least helping me with showing up more authentically. Um, but for the the writing practice, if you don't get to choose what to write about, Uh, then what else is it serving? Well, it's serving the writing. In the end, it continues to serve the writing. It it serves your writer brain. Um, And, you know, Natalie Goldberg always says it's you getting to know yourself and and letting the writing do the writing. I'm a believer, clearly, right? Two episodes in a row talking about it, but I just wanted to share with you this tiny connection that happened in one day that I truly feel wouldn't have happened without uh, the writing practice. So I think it's a, it's a simple enough thing to do. And in case I wasn't uh, clear about the process last week, basically you start with a meditation, what we've been doing in uh, the office hours and the live sessions and, and the recorded sessions with Natalie Goldberg is 10 minutes of a sitting meditation. So just sitting in your chair, you know, letting your eyes relax, placing your hands either on your lap or in front of you and just sitting for 10 minutes. And immediately after that, You focus on breath. You anchor to your breath while you're meditating, always focusing on your breath. Right after that, you open up your notebook and you have a topic. And if you have the writing down the bones uh, deck of cards, that's, you know, you can pull a card out. If you have the writing down the bones book, there's a a section that has writing topics. Um, But you can also, you know, just whatever topics you have, you just spend 10 minutes writing don't think. You keep the pen moving. You try to be as specific as possible. One example that Natalie always gives is that if you want to write about a car, don't write about a car. Write about the Cadillac. If you want to write about a tree, don't don't say tree. Say sycamore. Get the n- real names for things. That's training the writer brain. So um, that's one of the rules. But yeah, no judgment. Um, that's it. And then it's 10 minutes of writing in that way. And, and it did come up in one of the office hours. What if, I, what if I'm on a roll and I want to keep going? And uh, Dorotea, who is Natalie's uh, teaching assistant, had recommended, she said, there's something to be said for the structure. So whatever your time or limit is that you determine at the beginning, there is something to be said for sticking to it. So it doesn't have to be 10 minutes. You could say, I'm going to write for... 30 minutes or 20 minutes or for three pages like we do with morning pages um, and just and just stop whenever that is um, just because it's a practice and just like we show up for a team practice and then we don't just say oh I'm doing great and having fun let me stay out here all night coach says practice is over everybody goes home that's the end of that same thing with your writing practice and uh, and then we um, usually draw a line on the page pick a second topic and go again and then we and then we're done and we read aloud to each other I did say that last week but for a regular practice for yourself you can just do that meditation and and let your pen go and see what happens but uh that is all I wish you a wonderful week ahead uh tomorrow there will be a new short story on the storyhoarder.substack.com page The Girl Unplugged YA novel is now up to chapter 12. And in case you don't realize it, when you go to storyhoarder.substack.com, there are sections at the top of the page. So you could go straight to short stories or straight to Girl Unplugged, which is the novel, or straight to flash fiction. But on the Girl Unplugged page, there is a post at the top that's called the Table of Contents, and that has all the chapters linked in it. Um, all at once. So if you're coming to it late, you can start there. 
And, uh, and Friday is also writing prompt day. So tune into the, uh, YouTube channel, the NV Rivera YouTube channel for our brand new writing prompt of the week and get some more writing in that way. There is also a, um, NYC midnight, 100 word writing, um, contest coming up this week. If anyone is interested in those NYC midnight contests, uh, and I do believe they just announced their, I want to say it's their flash fiction contest that's coming up later on in the year. Um, those are really great contests. I've enjoyed participating in them, not only for the the deadline that you get and the prompts that you get, but also for the feedback that you get once you've submitted your story. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll put some links in the show notes for those in case you're interested. I'll also put a link in the show notes again for the 24 hour story that, uh, contest that I participated in this weekend from, um, I want to say it's writersweekly.com because they did announce at the end of this contest that the next quarter, uh, contest will be on July 16th and they've opened the door for submissions, uh, for contest entrance now. So you can part, and that one is a crazy cheap contest, just $5 for entry. Um, but I think that's it. Otherwise I want you to, like I said, have a great week, happy writing, and I will talk to you next Thursday. Thank you as always for listening.